This strong family bond of Christian love between Chuck, Emily, and Max bears fruit in so many ways. As Chuck and his wife Patty support Emily, Emily is thereby strengthened to give love, support, and teaching to Max. And of course, that fun-loving teenager can't help but give back to his mom and his grandparents. I mean, Max has taught them so many invaluable lessons and in areas of service, patience, long-suffering, commitment. But those lessons fade in comparison to what Max has taught them about joy. I'm always amazing. Patty and I marvel at the way that she takes everything in stride, uh, the way she coaxes Max, the way she teaches him. He can remember everything. And so he can uh, remember. You, Mom, yes, Max. Will you, will you have a soda party? <gasps> I'm going to come in in just a minute. We'll have a soda party. And what's the soda party? What kind of soda are you going to have? All or Pepsi. <laughs> you know, part of the, the challenge with autism is often the individuals seem quite removed. Max remembers everything, so I can't tell you that he really has been removed. It is just that they appear that way. And I found early on if I could get him giggling and laughing, he was so completely connected to me and connected to the situation. So. We have really built on that premise that we are going to laugh as much as we can. I have friends that call him the joy boy. Will anybody who knows anything about autistic children know that they, are, they have certain obsessions? Uh, Max has an obsession with car seats. Uh, I had an Audi with leather seats, which Max just loved. So then when the car was ready to be junked, uh, he wanted more than anything else to have those car seats. So his uncle got the seats out of the car and uh, bolted it onto a wooden base, and Max just loves it. He also has a seat out of a Volvo because he's fascinated by Volvos. You walk, in, walk into Emily's living room and you see a couch and a love seat and a chair, but you also see two car seats. That's home base for Max. <laughs> we started drawing about 10 years ago, everything that happens that he worries about, he talks to me about and I draw whatever he's saying. As an artist, this was a really um, logical outlet and answer to prayer. The amazing thing was his language just exploded. All of a sudden his language was concrete and things that he worries about were now on paper and they were done. This helped him alleviate a tremendous amount of anxiety. I think we have about 1,200 drawings. Her love is so deep and she realizes that God's love for her is the same love she has for her child. And so you feel it in her house. Grandma and Grandpa! Come in! Grandma and Grandpa! The real test of a Christian is, is this. No greater love has any man than he will lay his life down for his brother. And when you see someone lay their life down for someone else, which is what Emily is doing with Max, that's the gospel being lived out before your eyes. It's been a real blessing in our family. God's doing a profound work in this family, in Chuck's, Emily's lives, but also in a way no one expected, because God is doing something extraordinary in Max's life. When Max uh, was at a worship service, uh, Patty and I were in the worship hall, and Emily and Max were sitting in the uh, reception room. They saw a baptism taking place in the baptistry, and Max turned to his mother and said, I want to be baptized like that in Grandpa's pool. We all sat down with Max and asked him all these questions about Jesus, and he fully understood. Came to realize that if the pastor got in the pool, Max wouldn't get in the pool. So. Uh, I called the pastor and he ordained me for a day. When I baptized him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and put him down and came up, he was radiant. I could wallpaper a room with the reports of what he couldn't do. And I looked at him being baptized and I thought, but you know what, he can do the thing that is more important than tying your shoes. And can you write yet? He gave his life to Christ and he knew what he was doing. I don't suppose there's anybody ever been baptized where it was more meaningful to that person than it was with Max. He 
has an unusual quality of being able to share his love with other people. And, and he blesses us all, blesses me especially. He has some gifts that are, are so much more wonderful to be around and, so, and, and give so much more to other people than can he write well, can he write neatly. Oh, he can love perfectly. And I, I would choose that any day. If you look at something in the way it affects you first, uh, you can be very worried, very concerned. If you see how things are gonna affect God and with what you're doing, how that becomes a blessing to other people, that changes your nature completely. We've learned to appreciate Max and see God's handiwork in his life in ways that you wouldn't see it in most people's lives. When God allowed autism in that family, it wasn't a fluke of fate or a divine flip of the coin. I think you can see how even that tragedy, as some would call it, is bearing so much fruit in not just their lives, but in all those who come in contact with Max. But what if the disability in God's plan doesn't seem to include a happy ending? I have another friend, Dr. R.C. Sproul, who, like Chuck Colson, is a titan of the Christian faith and one of the most respected leaders in Christendom. Dr. Sproul is first and foremost a theologian. His life goal is to study and make known the character of God. He's the author of many books, and whether it's in a small classroom setting or in large conferences, R.C. loves to teach on the doctrines of the Christian faith. I can say he's had a huge impact on my own journey of faith with my disability. However, even for giants of the faith, Sometimes God's plan does not seem to include a happy ending because, like Chuck Colson, R.C. Sproul is the grandparent of a child with a severe disability. Believe me, his confidence in the sovereignty of God was put to the test when his grandchild was born, too. And how he and his family responded is quite a story. I have a father who's known the world around for, for trying to persuade people of the sovereignty of God and all his convictions in that, in that vein, he poured into me all my life. And I like to explain it like this, that anything that happens in this world, God knows, and he knows before it happens, and he has the power to stop it. And insofar he's made that decision to let it happen, he has ordained that it be so. Now God says, here's this challenge. Do you really believe that this is from my hand? Well, when R.C. Jr. and his wife Denise uh, had Shannon, their little girl, she was born with less encephali, which uh, means flat brain, as the brain normally has these uh, uh, ridges and convolutions in it. Hers was missing all of those, and that, of course, is a severe uh, impairment. She can't speak. She uh, isn't potty trained. You know, she has to be fed. Uh, and then also the, the medication to keep her from having the seizures. Plus the seizures when they overcome the medication, they all uh, make her a little unsteady on her feet as well. She usually has a real regular menu. Breakfast is almost always oatmeal and yogurt. Lunch or supper she'll have pasta and some baby food, and then the other meal is usually completely baby food. There are physically certain things that are difficult. Um, lifting her for me now is difficult, but there are times when I need to do that um, with getting her into bed or into the van um, or in the tub. And as much as we do try to do together as a family, there are limitations on what she is able to do, and so we can't necessarily take her she has to be tended to, she has to be watched. Shannon is our third oldest child. So since then, we have had four children that have started out smaller than her, who grow bigger than her, and in a manner of speaking, get older than her. But the greatest hardship for me is every day knowing that 